Screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival this July is a film called Finding Her Beat. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the co-directors, Dawn Mickelson and Kerry Pickett. Uh, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank, Thank you for having us. <laughs> Good to talk to you both. And uh, this is such an interesting documentary about women who play the taiko drums and uh, the big event that uh, you filmed that uh, leads up to uh, what's happening in Minnesota. Tell me about the origins of the documentary. How did it all come about? Well, um, so Jennifer Weir, who is one of the primary participants in the film, as well as now a, a producer on the film as well, um, Jen and I have been friends for over 20 years. And we were having lunch one day talking about, you know, our careers and what it's like to be women in in fields that are male dominated. And she mentioned that she had this dream of uh, bringing the top women from Tycho together from around the world and asked if I would film the concert just you know to have it documented um for historical purposes mainly and i uh i you know the more we talked i was like jen this isn't this isn't just a concert video this is the film this is a really powerful story in the making and we can do it because it's two years before the concert <laughs> so uh we started filming and you know immediately um brought Carrie on board Carrie is you know a director in her own right and a cinematographer and you know all-around rock star and we we decided we wanted to make the film in a way where the people in front of the camera were reflected behind the camera so besides Carrie and myself uh the majority of our crew over 90 percent is female non-binary queer or Asian uh and that I think gave us incredible access to not just the women who are and non-binary artists who are in it, but also to the emotional understanding of, of what they're experiencing as, as uh, women and queer folks and et cetera. What an interesting backstory. So tell me, uh, how did you both work together um, in terms of uh, directing and making this film? Well, um, I think that Dawn and I both are interested in uh, very similar kinds of stories in that we're both really interested in people who are, are trying to make a difference in the world, people who are struggling against the odds and who are in the margins. And um, I think that as storytellers, we just knew that working together, I think it it just became um, intuitive and it was just easy. I, I, you know, I've never done a co-directing situation before. And I must say that in a documentary realm, it's a kind of a tag team thing where I think we both really saw parts of it right away and we just put our vision on it but we also knew that it, we had to let it play out and that we were not going to put upon the story we were going to let the story unfold and so I think that in a documentary film you don't direct people so we're not directing in that way you know but we were directing together the way that the story is being told and then ultimately, both of us, um, as one of is on that, we're we're on the editing team, and so then then shaping that story to a place where it really fit our vision in many ways from the beginning in a in a in a way that took us a few edits to find <laughs> <laughs> a few, couple, two, three. <laughs> yes, the editing is always the fun part of uh, completing a documentary. <laughs> I understand that, speaking to so many filmmakers. Yeah. Now, I learned a great deal about Tycho. I had no idea, obviously, a male-dominated uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, endeavour. Um, so uh, it's so interesting how, how your documentaries, uh, documentary, both of you have revealed what Tycho is and uh, the role of women now in uh, Tycho. Yeah, no, it's uh, Tycho, you know, the reason I know about Tycho is my relationship with Jen. <laughs> so so I've known about it for 20 years, but most people who come to the theater, particularly at festivals, uh, have not experienced Tycho, and it's such a, a gift 
to be able to to share this beautiful art form. It's it's beautiful to watch. It's wonderful to hear. Um, if you are lucky enough to be in the theater at 5.1 surround sound, it's incredible to feel um, because the, you really get the like bass, big drum feel when when you're in a proper theater situation. But but regardless, it's <laughs> it's it's a powerful medium. And really, um, actually, when we first were ma making the film. We haven't talked about this a lot lately, but um, there was a time in Japan where they talked about how the taiko drum uh, resembled the sound uh, that a baby would hear in the womb. And so, you know, there's, there's a very primal, you know, core to who you are as a human being piece. And the other thing I think is interesting is that comparison with a woman's, you know, a woman and a mother um, and the drum. Uh -huh. I had been, I had been exposed to taiko drumming because I had actually photographed Jennifer or and her taiko the group that where she learned taiko from uh, ten years ago and I was really captivated by it so I had had some experience but I think that it's in a way the film is really interesting because it's about taiko but it's not about taiko at all it's really about these women having a vision seeing that the doors had been closed to them and that they really needed a way to get through those doors. And so they threw their own party to make it happen for themselves. And in the making, I think one of the things that we didn't realize at the time of filming is that history was really being made and that those vibrations and that concert, that her beat concert that Jennifer Weir produced, that we filmed, it was the journey to get to a place um, that was groundbreaking. And in a way, history has been made and those vibrations are now out there and they're reverberating and they're getting bigger with the film with as it's going in people's hearts because people are coming out of theaters crying and they're just so moved. And we've just had gotten so many audience awards and, you know, people really are genuinely touched. And that I think that... The beauty of this is that it's just everything about it is just authentic. Absolutely, yes. I, I was really quite moved by it, and it, it's it's incredible the uh, the the uh, the um, the strength of the drumming and the uh, and the emotions that are generated. It's a really quite uh, fascinating. Tell me, did both of you have much production behind you to be able to make the film? Because of course, some of it was shot in Japan uh, as well as in the US. Well, um, I was the director of photography and in Japan, I had a second photographer, a filmmaker with me, Shiho Fukada, and she was excellent and she helped bridge the gap for me for the language. And so I really thought that we would work more where she would kind of let me know what was going on, you know, but there was no time for that. Absolutely no time for that. And so... I just intuited and it's an art form and you're, you know, getting to see somebody in their element, you know, Chieko and Kaoli are both so different and unique and represent the opposite uh, attraction of Taiko where you have this tradition rooted in raw emotion and raw performance. And I didn't realize when I went to Japan that they would be who who they would be. I had no idea. I just saw their names and read their bios. Uh-huh. <laughs> how, how interesting to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think that, you know, our crew, uh, a lot of it came in during the post-production as well. And actually our um, our composer, her name is Mili Hay, and she is based in Australia. I believe she's in the Blue Mountains. And um, we... We found her online. Uh, we were looking for, again, we were looking for a woman because <laughs> we really wanted to keep reflecting the film and and found me lately. And she just, um, she brought so much heart to this project. Um, she uh, composed in a way that was complementary to the drums rather than, you know, you can easily have a conflict when there's so much music in the film already, but her music really just, brought in and filled out the emotions that otherwise um, maybe we wouldn't have been able to convey as as directly. 
Um, so, you know, every step along the way, we were bringing in collaborators who were at the top of their game, who were, you know, much like the women in front of the camera, um, creating as women behind the scenes, you know, our, our sound, uh, final sound designer at Skywalker Sound was um, one of the first women or only women to win an Oscar for uh, sound design. All right, so, you know, it's uh, bringing all of the the unicorns as Jen sometimes call them, calls them together and showing how not only are they, you know, they're special, but also there's a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I was also quite fascinated by the history of all this, and you've used some archival footage and uh, and and so on to explain um, the, the uh, uh, Tycho, how it's progressed over so many years. I found that quite fascinating too, and finding that material must have been uh, uh, quite interesting for you both. Yeah, I mean, we, we try our best to, to be very succinct in the background so that it was a, a story that was more about the present day. Mm. But, um, you know, I, it's always fun to, to research and find some good footage. And <laughs> so we, we found enough pieces that really conveyed where, where we'd been. And then the rest of the film is where we are and where we're going. And I think that's the beauty of the performance, for instance, when Tiffany Tamarabuchi and Chieko um, are sitting at the table at Kodo looking at this groundbreaking performance that Chieko had done 20 years before. Um, you know, it, that was a performance. So luckily it was filmed for posterity. You know, somebody had their video camera. And so it was filmed. And so, yeah, we were so lucky that we were talking about an art form that you know people had documented in mm -hmm. the past and then some of the photos came from the walls of the Kodo itself on Sado Island and Sado Island is such a beautiful remote place you can kind of see how an ancient tradition would be able to last there for so long because it's very remote and a fishing village and kind of small and you, you know you can see how change would go slowly there uh-huh Again, very, very interesting to hear that. Now, I, I love the countdown, the uh, uh, over two years, the, the way you both uh, shot uh, the uh, events leading up to the big concert uh, in Minnesota. And uh, and I must uh, get you to talk about that as well, the actual uh, performance, but uh, which looks great. But um, filming off and on and deciding which months or days and weeks in, in advance to film, that must have been interesting in itself. Well, I mean, some of it, you know, again, this goes back to the collaboration with with Jen and with Megan and, you know, all the Tycho players is, you know, we we were constantly talking to them about what's coming up, what's going to be part of this story, what and and to be fair, Jen is a, a theater director, so she she knows a good narrative. She knows when a story, um, the key components to make a story. So she was a great collaborator in being, you know, like this thing is coming up. And I think it's important. And then we, you know, for example, we had asked her, when do you talk about Tycho? When do you talk about the history of Tycho? Because something we hadn't, I don't think we've said yet, is that the film is cinema verite. So there are no interviews. It's all fly mm -hmm. on the wall, you know, captured. The audio is all captured as people are living their lives, doing their thing. So all of this, you know, information about the history of Tycho um, conveniently is something that Jen delivers to audiences before performances and that kind of thing. So, and then an interview with Chaco, um, we didn't interview her, but she was being interviewed by the media it was while so they were good. filming. <laughs> it was perfect. So we were able to film her interview and still it's stay cinema cheating, but not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well done on that. That that's so fascinating. Another side uh, thing that I found fascinating is those actual drums. They're incredible. Um, where uh, where are they manufactured and and so on? Because to tune them right to uh, to be part of this Tyco is just incredible. Carrie, do you have a insight well, on that? Um, I we were wo wonderfully sponsored by some of the best drum makers who sent us drums and um, the support that came from the Tycho community was huge. And along the way, um, 
uh, you know, I mean, Jen Weir at Tycho Arts Midwest has some very large drums, but some of those big, big, big drums came from, they were loners. <laughs> and right. Not only did the drums come from afar, but people flew in from as you know far as Hawaii and overseas to come to the concert because that was so breakthrough in the Tycho community. And when Tycho jumped to North America, as it says and you know indicates in the film, it really became um, embraced by women. And um, so it's uh, got a lot of heart. There's a lot of heart in that community around Tycho, a lot of love. And um, they showed up for the film and the, uh, the audience that night was just the energy in the room for the final performance. I'm sorry if I don't wanna be like a, spoiler alert or anything but you know it was like really awesome you know some people say it's the people I know who have been in the music industry said that it was one of their favorite concerts they had ever seen uh-huh tell me about that theater in Minnesota it's uh it it looks like a, a, a an excellent theater and to be able to fill it um with something that is quite unusual uh is uh quite profound in many respects and filming that uh, the actual concert that must have been quite a process well um it was uh very exciting uh I have personally never done anything like this this was a very big challenge and leap for me and I had um the uh help of Carolyn Mariko Stuckey who uh on the team on the American side for a second for an additional and wonderful camera and so there were five cameras on that and we really could have used well we had six when I count my GoPro because <laughs> when I, so we really did have six cameras only like, five humans operating however. five humans six cameras <laughs> and it would have been fabulous to have had one more it really would have been just great but you know that's amazing like have I ever done anything like that no this was a a chance where really we all got to grow and expand and become uh, our best selves in the process of working on this film well, and and to you know the the size of the theater. Um, one of the things that's it, it echoes what Carrie was talking about about people came from you know maybe half the theater was people from Minnesota or you know this region, but you know estimating that you know half of them came from across North America mm -hmm. and beyond to to see this show because it was it was groundbreaking it was historic and. So, you know, particularly the Tycho community, which is a passionate community, um, you know, people are flying out from everywhere to to be at this show. And so, yeah, to I think we learned it sold out um, relatively early when tickets went on sale. It sold out relatively quickly. Um, so we knew it was going to be sold out, but it's it's still, you don't that doesn't prepare you for the day you walk in and that room is full of thousands of people you know <laughs> it's a it's exciting yeah. one of the backstories that is not in the film is that for two days i think before the concert um like thousands of school children were brought in and got to see it during the day like school schools would just send their kids by the truckloads and um we didn't film that because of obvious reasons just you know just so many children it's um uh it when it, it was it's so exciting to see how thrilled and how thrilled they were right but um now taiko groups come to our screenings and play at the theaters and so one time I was at the Sonoma Film Festival and the group was at it was like a fourplex eightplex theater and big place with cars everywhere and the drummers start going and all the car alarms start going off <laughs> <laughs> because of the vibration it was so strong all the yeah. so it was like the drumming and then the eh, eh. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun it's great to have our our screenings have become happenings where Tycho communities get invested and, you know, get to shine. And when people say, 
where do I go to find out more about this Tycho? I want to play Tycho. Then right, the people are right there and they go, just come with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see that there'll be ongoing uh, concerts and events uh, for Tycho now that uh, the, the groundbreaking event has really happened. So, uh, uh, and your documentary has certainly uh, assisted in that process. So uh, very well done. Um, so, as you've already alluded to, the reaction to your film has been uh, quite incredible, especially the uh, uh, empowering women to uh, go into non-traditional uh, sorts of areas like like Tycho. Um, uh, tell me about reactions you've had at different film festivals. Well, I don't want to brag, but, you know. Uh, jury awards and audience awards and it's I you know the at Bentonville Film Festival Gina Davis's film festival this young woman came up to us and she was just tears just flooding down her face and she just said that she stumbled upon the film and loved it and saw herself in it saw her story as a Korean adoptee in the film and was just so moved and just she was just so grateful and saying thank you, thank you as the tears were flowing. Uh huh. And has the film been seen back in Japan? Not yet. That is that is the next uh, <laughs> the next thing, the next uh, bridge to cross, if you will. Um, we're excited to screen there, and actually, Kodo and Goko, uh, the two uh, Taiko groups that Kaoli and uh, Chiko are a part of, are excited to do corresponding concerts and, you know, they, they want to be part of sort of a mini tour of Japan. So we need to figure that out yet. Yeah, that's uh, contingent on a handful of things, but uh, yeah, I think we're all hoping to go and and do a big splash in Japan. And the, the Japanese performers have seen the film. We have shared it with them and they are just so excited to be able to share this with their home audiences. One of the things that has come about is that um, the State Department has asked us to become cultural ambassadors, and they have a program that I didn't know about called American Showcase Films, where they offer films to their list of embassies around the world, and the films um, are on a list where they're available to these embassies, and sometimes the embassies do screenings and bring in they can bring in two directors a year or something like that, uh, you know, to, for two films or something. And so the film is going to have a chance to be considered in a global audience that we would have never, ever anticipated. Uh huh. Well, now Australian audiences and Melbourne audiences can experience uh, uh, Finding Her Beat as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, which is fantastic. Uh, just to conclude, I must ask you both, are you working on other films at the moment? We, we can't help ourselves. Um, <laughs> both, both together and separately, we're, we're working on films. I, I actually just released a film called Minnesota Mean that is about the world of women's roller derby. And uh, that film is also doing the festival circuits. It's a little bit earlier, you know, it's it's just starting its festival run. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of living in this world of, of women making big noises and uh, <laughs> crashing around. Um, <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. And then I'm, I'm working with Carrie on a couple of her films to help her get those out the door as well. Yeah, I, I've got a small little pile uh, growing of um, projects in various stages of development. I filmed the Indigenous women standing up against the Enbridge Tar Sands Line 3 pipeline in 2021. And um, I hope to bring a film, film to fruition of that. And I did a film in uh, 10 years ago called The Fabulous Ice Age, and I'm doing kind of a spin-off of, of the main character who's trying to preserve the history of theatrical ice skating. I'm doing a film more on his life because he's a grandfather of gay photography and my uncle. And I've been filming him for um, a couple of decades now. And so I've asked Dawn to come in and help me edit and whatever she can do, whatever she wants to do, like <laughs> let's just work together. 
because I've really enjoyed um, having a team for finding her beat. It's been we we you know kind of consider ourselves the dream team because um, everybody just up, uplifts everybody else, and it's there. Everybody's a dream to work with. <laughs> Sounds terrific. Great projects and great collaborations. Look, uh, congratulations on Finding Her Beat, screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. And we've been speaking to the co-directors, Dawn Mickelson and Kerry Pickett. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Thank you so for much. having us. All Bye, the best. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>